Someone sent me a car, uh, a, an Israeli cartoon yesterday. It was a guy with a small pile of gemaras like Moe Kutten, Beitza, Megillah, Chag Chagiga, and then this huge, looming, foreboding gemara Yavamas with this mean face. <laughs> and it says, Lifamim ha-chagiga nigmar, which means party's over. <laughs> chagiga means party. Party's over, guys. So um, now it's time to separate the men from the boys. Um, yeah, that's right. So Seder, Seder Nashim, Seder Nashim is all about um, uh, uh, halachas that govern the relationships between men and women, um, and all of the things that go along with that, both permitted and prohibited. And uh, it, it, it sometimes gets very complicated. And that's the reason why Seder Nashim and Seder Nazikin are two of the classic uh, Sidre uh, Siddharm of Talmud that are studied in Litvisha Yeshivas to attenuate and to sharpen the minds of our young men. So, as you'll see, uh, we're going to ease our way gently into Maseches Yevamos without getting into too much uh, difficulty. But you'll understand that the entire cadence of the Mishnah and the concepts are completely different from what we've been uh, familiar with in Seder Moed. Much more abstract ideas, permutations, computations that you have to keep in your head while we're having this discussion. A lot of con conceptual, abstract ideas. So, Chamesh Yisrei Nashim is the beginning of our Mishnah. <clears throat> it talks about 15 women. Now, uh, the, this Mishnah is about the mitzvah of Yibum, which is leveret marriage, as you know. And if I'm, if I'm leaving out any vital pieces of information, please stop me. I'm assuming that everyone has a modicum of information about the mitzvah of Yibum. When a man's brother dies he ha without children, there is a mitzvah for the surviving brother to marry the widow and to begin a new home to have children with that woman. If the brother dies with children, then not only is there no mitzvah of Yibum, but this woman is prohibited to him as what's called an Ashes Ach. It's one of the arayos, it's one of the forbidden relationships that's discussed in Leviticus chapter 18. So, what, are you, what about a situation where a man's brother, Ruvain, has a brother, Shimon. Shimon dies, and he leaves over, he's married to a couple of women. One of the women that he's married to is someone that had a pre-existing erva re uh, relationship with the surviving brother, such that even if the brother was not married to her, it would be forbidden for, her to, for him to marry this woman because they're related in some way. The theme of the Mishnah is not only is there no mitzvah of Yibum in that case because he's not capable of marrying her, but the entire household is no longer, there's no longer a mitzvah of Yibum for the surviving brother to that household of his brother, such that even if he has another wife who was not an erva to him, someone, a woman who's called a tsara to the other wife, which means a rival or a co-wife, then there is no mitzvah of Yibum whatsoever. How do we know this? The Gemara will discuss this later, but this is the basic halacha. So there are 15 different kinds of women who are prohibited to the surviving brother because of a pre-existing erva condition, and therefore potros tsarosein v'tsaros tsarosein min hachalitzo min hayibum ad sofa olam. And therefore, not only do they exempt their household, meaning their co-wives, from yibum, but let's say there are three brothers. There's Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi. Shimon passes away. He leaves over two wives. One of those wives is one of these 15 women who was prohibited in marriage to Ruvain, and therefore Levi is the one who has the mitzvah of Yibam. Ruvain doesn't have the mitzvah of Yibam. Well, Levi chooses to go ahead and do Yibum not with the woman that's one of the 15 that was prohibited to Ruvain, but to her co-wife. He takes the tsara of this woman. And then Levi passes away, and Levi leaves over two wives. One is the, his, his original wife, and the other one is the tsara that he did Yibum with. Well, because this tsara was not permitted because of her original co-wife, when she was married to Shimon, she also exempts Levi's other wife, which is called the Tsaras Tsara, the, the co-wife of the co-wife, the, from the second marriage. 
she also is, is exempt from the mitzvah of Yubam, and Reuven cannot do Yubam to either wife. And this goes ad infinitum, so potentially there could be a hundred brothers where this would continue ad infinitum to a co-wife of a co-wife of a co-wife of a co-wife, etc. So that's the way it works. And, and basically the rationale is, is that once the mitzvah of Yubam is off, then the co-wife, the tzara, has the status of an eshesach. She has the status of being for, prohibited to Ruvain as the wife of his brother. The wife of your brother outside the context of Yubam is prohibited to you. So if there's no mitzvah of Yubam, she automatically becomes an erva, and therefore if she goes and marries another brother in the context of Yubam, and then that brother dies, so then she's prohibited to me, and therefore her co-wife is prohibited to me as well. Okay, so that's the idea. So now, the the follow. These are the following fifteen women. So you can count them off if you want, but there's a total of fifteen different halachas here. Bito, a man's daughter. So Ruvain has a daughter. Her name is Rachel, and it's as was very common in in bygone generations. It was very common for an uncle to marry his niece which is permitted according to the Torah. The opposite is not permitted. An aunt may not marry her nephew according to the Torah, but an uncle may, and it was very common for an uncle to marry his niece. So Shimon marries Rachel, Ruvain's daughter. Shimon then dies, and then Rachel falls to Yibam. Well, Ruvain can't do Yibam with his own daughter, and therefore not only does he not do Yibam with his daughter, but he doesn't do Yibam with Shimon's other wife, the Tsar. Now, as will, will become clear from the Gemara shortly, when we say a man's daughter, we're not talking about a man's daughter that he bore uh, in a marital relationship. This is a man who had a daughter outside in, a, in an extramarital affair. He had a daughter. And the reason why is because there's going to be another girl on this list, another woman on this list, who's called Bas Ishto, which is the daughter of my, his wife. And the daughter of my wife is prohibited to me. That's explicit in the Torah. My daughter is not prohibited explicitly, but if someone's the daughter of my wife, she can either be my daughter, my biological daughter, or my daughter through marriage, because my wife came into the marriage with this daughter. In both cases, the Torah equally prohibits her, but it only prohibits explicitly a daughter that is born to me through marriage or that I acquire through marriage. But if, let's say, I have an extramarital affair and I have a daughter as a result, then that daughter, even though she's prohibited to me, that's not explicit in the Torah. We'll, we'll see just in, in later on. Ubas bito, ubas bino. Similarly, a granddaughter, either through my son or through my daughter, if she goes ahead and marries my brother Shimon, and then Shimon dies, so then I can't do yibum with either of those as well. Bas ishto, that's what I mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, the daughter of Ruvain's wife, goes ahead and marries Shimon, and Shimon dies. Ubas bino, ubas bita, and similarly, um, Ruvain's wife's granddaughter, either from her son or from her daughter. Chamoso, the aim chamoso. Now, if Ruvain's mother-in-law, she becomes a widow. She goes ahead and marries Ruvain's brother, Shimon. Strange family, but it could happen, right? Okay. So then in that situation, um, if uh, Shimon dies, then his mother-in-law falls to Yibum. Right? So that's not going to happen. So therefore, that's another one of the 15. The Aim Chamiv, and the Aim Chamoso, the Aim Chamiv, included in that is the mother of one's mother in law or the mother of one's father in law. If those women marry the Ruvain's brother Shimon, then they can't fall to Yibam to Ruvain. Achoso Meimo, so next, next case. The mitzvah of Yibam is only with your paternal brother, either a full brother or a half-brother from your father. Let's say Reuven and Shimon are half-brothers from their father. They have a common father, but, the, but two different mothers. And Reuven has a sister from a different mother. So this sister is related to Reuven, and she's prohibited to him as an erva, but she's not related at all to Shimon. So Shimon goes ahead and marries her, and when Shimon dies, she can't fall for Yibam. Va'achos imo, Similarly, if Ruvain's mother has a sister and Shimon is only Ruvain's half-brother from the father, he's allowed to marry that aunt of Ruvain, but, but that's an erva to Ruvain. Ba'achos ishto, and if Ruvain's wife has a sister and Shimon marries her, so achos ishto is also an erva. You can't marry your sister-in-law. Now just store this in the back of your data banks. Achos ishto, your sister-in-law from your wife, is the only erva 
where post-mortem the erva flies off. What I mean by that is, and this was done also commonly in, in bygone eras, that if a man is married and his wife dies, then his wife's sister is permitted for marriage after death. But while his wife is alive, that woman is an erva. Many great gedolim, the Chafetz Chaim, married his sister-in-law after his wife passed away. There are many recorded, documented cases of this. But this is the only case where an erva, all other ervas, even if the relationship, the person who creates the relationship passes away, that erva is permanent. So, for example, my mother-in-law, even if a person's wife dies, his mother-in-law is always his mother-in-law permanently. You can never marry your mother-in-law. Ve'eshes achiv me'imo, a person's, um, uh, um, uh, let's say, a Ruvain has a, a paternal brother and he has a maternal brother from his mother, totally unrelated to Shimon. And then his maternal brother passes away and he leaves over a widow. Shimon is allowed to marry her because they're not related. Okay, but if, she, if Shimon then dies and she falls to Yibam for Ruvain, Ruvain can't marry her. Next case is Eishas Achiv Shalohaya Be'olama. Now, what is that case? So let's talk about a situation of three brothers, Reuven, Shimon, and Levi. Reuven is the oldest brother. He's many, many years. He's 20 years older than Levi. But Shimon was alive when Reuven was alive, but Levi is only born after Reuven dies. So here's what happens. Ruvain passes away, leaves over a widow without any children. Shimon is able to do Yibum. Now, but Shimon is younger than Ruvain, but Shimon can still do Yibum because he was alive when Ruvain passed away. Levi is born shortly after Ruvain dies. There's no mitzvah of Yibum for an unborn brother. The, the brother has to be alive at the time of the death of the decedent in order to have the mitzvah of Yibum. And if he's not alive, then the status of that woman that was Ruvain's wife to Levi is she's an Eishazach, she's an Erva. It's his brother, it's his, uh, his brother's <coughs> wife that there's no mitzvah of Yibum. Shimon has done Yibum with Ruvain's widow, and then Shimon dies. So she falls now to Yibum for Levi, but Levi can't do Yibum for her because there's a pre existing condition of Eishazach. That she's not, uh, she, there's no, there was no mitzvah of Yibum from the, fir, from the first brother. So therefore, that's another one of the 15 women. So there's an Eishas Ach, even if he was alive? Yeah, yeah. She's an erva. She's an erva to him because it's, it's his sister-in-law from his brother. Okay. Hare e, so, and then finally, the Kalasa. If Ruvain has a daughter-in-law and his son dies, and then Shimon, his brother, marries his ex-daughter-in-law, so that's another example of where the erva continues post-mortem, and therefore, if Shimon dies, it's his former daughter-in-law, she doesn't fall for evil. Hare elu potros tsarosehen, vitsaros tsarosehen, min ha-chalitza u min ad sofa So all of these people, all of these women, they will they themselves are exempt from Yibum, and therefore they exempt their co-wife, and therefore they also exempt their co-wife's co-wife ad infinitum. I have a quick question. Yeah. How old do you have to be in order to do this? In your case before with the three brothers, uh, one right. wasn't born. How right. old do you have to be in order to do this? So the simple understanding is you have to wait till he's capable of consummating a marriage. And the Gemara will discuss how old that is, whether it's nine years old or whether it's 13 years old, bar mitzvah. The Gemara will go, will go through. But there have been many situations where a woman has pa- uh, a brother has passed away, and the surviving brother is just an infant. The woman would have to wait until the surviving brother is old enough to either do chalitz or yibum. These are cases that are actual, real, real cases. Yeah, that's a story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, we have to wait, wait, yes, wait till yes, till, yes. till Shayla. Would a woman couldn't marry someone else. A woman is not allowed to marry until she either gets yibum or chalitz. Wow. Okay, so there are even cases. There's one case now in Toronto where a woman's waiting for chalitza. Okay, so these are these are these are real life cases. What is she called? A woman at that point for those twelve years. What is she? She's a yavama. She yavama. She's a yavama. She's a yavama, and she's not permitted to the shuk. She's not permitted to the outside until business is finished with the family. So she has so to wait she, till he grows up. Together. She has to wait till he becomes old enough to Ooh. do chalitza. Wow. Yeah, but we don't do evil. We don't do yibum. We only do chalitza. Just at that time, the kid's a baby, and 
because the baby she has, she has to do chalitza with that surviving brother. So can't represent that right. Baby. No. So see here here's the thing. There's something called there's something called zika. This is a word that will become relevant throughout Maseches Yevamos. Zika is a type of marital, a pseudo-marital connection that exists between her and the surviving brothers of her husband. Okay? And that needs to either be continued through yibum, carried out, in other words, one of the brothers does yibum to cement that zika, or he has to create a severance of that zika to allow her to go and get remarried to someone outside the family. And chalitza is like a divorce in the, in the sense that just like a get creates severance of a marital relationship, chalitza creates severance of zika, which is this yavama connection to her family, to her husband's family. Okay? So if there was another brother there that didn't have to wait for the babies, only, only because there's no other boys in that family. Yeah, yeah, correct, yeah, correct. Well, someone had... Well, she'll have to wait. Either the older brother will do chalitza, or if he refuses, she'll have to wait for the baby to grow up. In either way, she has to get chalitza from some one of the surviving brothers. Yeah. Okay. Now, Hare elu pochos tzars mitzvah sem yin chalitza v'nidu avsu falom v'kul ani meso o mianu o nizgarshu o shenimtsu ailonis tzarosayin mutaros. Now, another qualification. That if one of these, uh, these these 15 women we said cannot fall to Yibam because of their pre existing erva condition to the surviving brother, what would happen if, however, Shimon, who's the brother who passes away, created a severance of his marriage to the erva before he passed away? So either the erva woman, one of these 15 women, died before Shimon died. Oh, Mianu, or she did Mion. Now, the principle of Mion is that if a girl is under the age of Bas Mitzvah, she's a minor, and her father no longer has control over her marriage and divorce, and that happens in the following scenario. A father marries off his daughter, and her first husband divorces her. She then becomes what's called an orphan in her father's lifetime, which means now that she doesn't need her father's consent in order to remarry. She can go ahead and remarry, and if she, but it's only a rabbinical marriage because it's not under her father's tutelage and control. It's not. It's therefore considered to be a rabbinic marriage, and there's no marriage by the Torah because she's not yet old enough to have, be of consenting age. But she gets married. We let her get married, and the halacha is that if she wants to opt out of the marriage, since it's a rabbinic marriage to begin with. She just has to go back to the same rabbis and say, I don't want to be married to this man anymore. She goes to before a base and says, I don't want to be married to this man. That's called miyun, and we annul the marriage. It's one of the few cases of marriage annulment, because it's only a rabbinic marriage. That's what's called miyun. So therefore, if you have a situation where, let's say, Ruvain's daughter is married to Shimon, and before Shimon dies, she does miyun in front of a basin, so then when Shimon dies... Whatever other wife Shimon had does fall for Yibam to Ruvain because there's no, uh, his daughter is not part of that household anymore because Shimon died after he created a severance with that wife that was an erva. Oni Skarshu. Or if Ruvain's daughter was divorced from Shimon before Shimon died, in that case also, the Tsara, the other wife that Shimon had, does fall for Yibam before Ruvain. Oshanimsu Islandis. And the fourth possibility is that if Ruvain's daughter was married to Shimon, and even if she was married to him when Shimon passed away, but it's discovered that this young lady is an islandist. Now, an islandist is a woman who displays certain physical characteristics of being completely infertile. So, for example, Chazal say that Sarah Imenu was an islandist because she had physical characteristics which displayed either that she had no uterus or she was completely incapable of bearing children. In that scenario, and the more we'll talk about this later, in that scenario, because the Torah only says that a woman who is capable of bearing children falls for Yibam and is in the Parsha of Yibam, is in the category of Yibam to begin with, since this woman is not capable of bearing children, she does not. She is not part of this whole mitzvah. Which there's no zika created between her and the surviving brother at all, and therefore, even if she was married to Shimon at the time of Shimon's death, 
Shimon's co-wife, the, the other woman, does fall to Yibum for Reuven, even though uh, Reuven's daughter was the other wife. Now, in all of those cases, therefore, Tsarosei and Mutaros, therefore the co-wife is permitted to Reuven. However, two out of those four categories, either the category of Miu or the category of Islandess, would not apply to the following three of the 15 women. Your mother-in-law, your mother-in-law's mother, or your father-in-law's mother, you cannot say that these are women that are capable of doing miyun, because miyun can only be done by a minor. The, the fact that you're married to your mother-in-law's daughter means that your mother-in-law is not a minor, because if she was a minor, she wouldn't be able to have a child that you'd be capable of marrying. And the Gemara will clarify this, but it's, it's, it's pretty intuitive, right? Obviously, if a girl's 11 years old, even if she were to theoretically have a child, miraculously, how am I going to get married to that child, right? So therefore, it's not really possible to have a situation where your mother-in-law is a minor to do mean. Similarly, you can't have a mother-in-law who's an islandess. Because by definition, an islandess is a woman who's incapable of bearing children. And therefore, how could I be married to her daughter? Okay, so those are, the three, those are the three cases out of the 15, which you cannot say they're either doing me or being an islandess. Now, case at Poshas are saying, now the rest of the mission is really just things that we've already spoken out, so we can go through this quickly. How does one of these 15 exempt her co-wife from Yibum? Haisabito echas mikol harayus ha'elu, nesuos la'achev. So if, let's say, Ruvain's daughter or any of the other 14 women who are in erva to Ruvain are married to Ruvain's brother Shimon, the lo isha acheres, and Shimon has another wife in addition to that daughter, umes, and then Shimon dies. Keshem Shabito Petura Kach Tsarasa Petura. So just like uh, Ruvain's daughter does not fall to Yibum, so too all of the other co wives do not fall for Yibum. That's what it means that she exempts her Tsara from Yibum. Halcha Tsaras Bito Veniseis Lachiv Hasheni. Now, if the, the Tsara of Ruvain's daughter goes ahead and does Yibum with Levi, which is another brother, and then Levi dies, Velo Isha Cheresumes, and then Levi dies, and he leaves over two wives. One was the Tzara of, of Ruvain's daughter, and the other one was his other wife. So in that situation, Keshem should Tzaras Bito Petura, Kach Tzaras Tzarasa Petura. So therefore, just like the Tzara of Ruvain's daughter does not fall to Yibum, because she's an Eish Sach, she's the wife of his brother without the mitzvah of Yibum, so too the Tzara of that Tzara, the Tzara, the co-wife of that co-wife of his daughter, also will not fall for Yibum. And that's why it could be the Afilu Hain Meya. And therefore it could happen even a hundred times. Keitzad, Imesu, Tsarosei, and Mutaros. And therefore if, if uh, a hundred brothers die, and each time that a brother dies, another brother does Yibum with the co-wife of the one who was the Tsara, going back to the original sequence, so then it could be the co-wife of a co-wife of a co-wife of a co-wife ad infinitum. Haisa bito echas mikol harayas ha'ilu nesuos la'achiv velo isha acheres. So, so the, the 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 Mishnah really speaks it out. So, if if a man's daughter or one of the other arayos was married to his brother Shimon, Shimon dies velo isha acheres. And I'm sorry, this is the opposite case where Kate said in mesut saro same with us. What's the case that if the woman dies before? The, before Shimon dies, then the Tzara does fall for Yibam. She's permitted to do Yibam with Ruvain. That if Ruvain's daughter was married to Shimon, right, and Velo Isha Acheres, and Shimon has another wife, Umesabito, and then Ruvain's daughter dies before Shimon dies, Oniskarsha, or she gets divorced, or she does Miun, or she's discovered to be an islandess, the Acher Kach Mes Achiv, and then Shimon dies. Sarasa Muteris. So then the other the remaining wife of Shimon does fall for Yibum and she goes she does Yibum with Ruvain. The Chol Hayecholo Lemoin Velo Miana, Sarasa Cholets Velo Misyabemis. And the final halach of our Mishnah is that remember, Mian is a rabbinic marriage, it is not a biblical marriage. So in the event that Ruvain's daughter is rabbinically married to Shimon, she's a minor, she's subject to Mian, but she did not do Mian. And therefore, when Shimon died, she was rabbinically married. The only problem is like this. Biblically, Shimon is not married to her. 
So therefore, if Shimon has another wife, that other wife biblically falls to Yibam for Ruvain. But rabbinically, because she's the tsara of Ruvain's daughter, then she does not fall for Yibam. So <coughs> biblically, she falls for Yibam. Rabbinically, Ruvain can't do Yibam with her. So the only option, therefore, is, is that he has to do Chalitza. Normally, in a situation where a woman is a tsara of an erva, then not only is there no Yibam, but there's no Chalitza, because there's no Zika. There's no connection whatsoever. But here there is a biblical connection between Shimon's other wife and Reuven because Reuven's daughter is only rabbinically married to Shimon. And therefore he's got to do chalitza, but he can't do yibam. Let's take a look at the Gemara. The Gemara is going to ask a technical question, which is very straightforward, which is what, why did you order the 15 women in the way that you ordered them? You started with daughter, then you went to granddaughter, then you went to your wife's daughter, then you went to mother-in-law. Why did you order it in that way? So first of all, we're going to see some information later on. How do you know in the first place that any time a woman is in erva, she does not fall for Yubam and she exempts the entire household? We're going to see that it's based on a source text, which is mentioned in Sefer Vayikra, talking about all of the Arayos. And it's going to be teaching me based on a, an extraneous verbiage that is contained by one sister-in-law, from his wife's sister. We're going to learn from the extra verbiage in the Pasuk by a wife's sister that if a wife's sister is married to, if Ruvain's wife's sister is married to his brother and his brother died, there's no Zika whatsoever. And we learn all of the other Arayos from the case of Achos Ishto from the wife's sister. So if that's the case, list the Achos Isha Beresha. Why then didn't you list that one first since that's the source text of all of the other cases? Maybe I'll answer like this. The mission is going in descending order of severity of penalty, which means that uh, if you learn like Reb Shimon who says that the highest level or the most stringent level of death penalty is death by burning, and you hold that that's more stringent than stoning, <clears throat> so then you can make out a sequence. You start with daughter because the death penalty for, for being with one's daughter is burning, and similarly with a granddaughter, and similarly with a mother-in-law. And then it'll go in descending order. So if that's the case, Well, if that's the case, then you should have listed your mother-in-law first in the list, because the only time that the Torah explicitly says that the death penalty for an erva is burning is in the context of mother-in-law, and we learn daughter from mother-in-law, as we'll learn later on in the Gemara. So if you're going to be listing them, list the one that's the source text for the law of burning. When I was, lear- when I was teaching this Gemara earlier this morning, a guy couldn't stop laughing. I said, why are you laughing? It's because the, the act itself is worse than the penalty, right? <laughs> right? So anyway, va'od, basar, va'od, basar chamoso, lisni kalaso, the basar sreifa skila chamura. And furthermore, if you're going in descending order of severity, then after you listed mother-in-law, which is death by burning, you should have immediately gone to the last item on the list, which is daughter-in-law, because there, that's the death penalty by stoning. And other arayos that are on this list, you don't get death penalty at all, you only get kare. So why did you save kalaso for the last, daughter-in-law for the last? Ella Bito, so the answer is, it's the, the real, here's the really answer. Bito kevin da asya me drasha chavivole. The Gemara says, daughter is the only one on this list whose prohibition to Ruvain is not listed explicitly in the Torah, but is derived through rabbinic hermeneutics. All of the other cases here, we know that she doesn't fall for Yubum based upon a Pasuk. But by daughter, it's only based on rabbinic derivation, based on what we call a drasha. So the Gemara says, wait a minute, kulu namimi drasha asu. All of them also, except for achos ishto, we learn out from a drasha, based upon the fact that an erva does not fall for yibum. That's also based all on rabbinic hermeneutics. So the Gemara says, you don't understand. Nihid le'inyin yibum asu mi drasha, ikar isurayu behed yiksiv behu. So, but bito ikar isura mi drasha. So the difference is like this, that by all of the other arayos, you're right, we derive in all of these 15 women cases that they don't fall for Yibam using a drasha, using rabbinic hermeneutics. But we see the, the fact that they're prohibited to Ruvain is explicit in the Torah. All of the other 14, they are explicitly forbidden to Ruvain by the Torah. 
right? The only one that is not explicitly written in the Torah is that a man's daughter that is born through an extramarital relationship is forbidden to the man. That's not something that's written explicitly. It's written. It's only derived through rabbinic rabbinic uh, derivation, and the fact that it's derived through rabbinic derivation makes it more precious to the author of the Mishnah, and that's why he writes it first. And then we're going to go through the rest of the ordering of the Mishnah, Mirzah Shem, tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. I had a baby.